a professor at the Frontier Nursing University, which is the number one and the longest running midwifery program in the United States. And it was the first uh, university that started um, family nurse practitioner program as well in the country. I'm uh, also on the board of directors for the American College of Nurse Midwives and I oversee uh, seven states in the I'm region four rep. I've been a midwife since 1992. Worked with Elliot, Dr. Levine in uh, Chicago. I've done birth in all birth areas, home, hospital, freestanding birth center. We had an in-hospital birthing center in Chicago and I have worked we had the first in the United States, uh, and um, I have worked in Arizona, California, Illinois, Michigan, and I'm uh, originally from Canada. So, yes, I currently live in Michigan now, outside of Detroit. So what I'm going to talk about really is um, how pregnancy and how we actually birth and um, why these matter. And a lot of uh, some of my discussion has also, uh, Dr. Hamami did a great job yesterday really talking about some of the social determinants as well. So some of what I was going to do was to review national and international standings with regard to infant and uh, maternal mortality, discuss the Detroit racial health disparities and the social and economic conditions which are intrinsically linked with health. Um, present the life course conceptual model of racial disparity, which has really d demonstrated um, adverse birth outcomes from effects of chronic and toxic stress, and then discuss a few exemplars of models of care um, which we've been utilizing in um, Detroit, as well as uh, the model of care of nurse midwifery, which is one of, tends to be one of a little bit less intervention. Um, except when evidence has been shown to display that there's a better outcome. And then offer strategies of how to support normal physiologic birth. So I loved this um, saying. I heard it when I was at the International Confederation of Midwives in um, South Africa. So if you want to go fast, you go alone. And if you want to go far, you go together. So I think that's one thing. Um, I love the international flavor of everyone that's here, as well as um, when we're trying to evoke change, I think really making sure that you have collective thoughts and people are on board with moving forward. So births in the United States, we can see from here that approximately uh, um, uh, each year, uh, how many births that we have had, and these are in um, million. And then uh, of the top 10 diagnostic categories by hospitals, we can see that childbirth and newborn care is uh, in the top two. So um, pregnancy and newborn care combined accounts for more than 8 million discharges, uh, and that's from data from the year 2012. So um, total estimated payments, um, obviously is a large, of money, uh, large amount of money, $66 billion, and that's broken down by payer. So um, Medicaid, private, uninsured. So how are we looking in the year? The latest stats that we have are from 2012, so approximately 4 million births. And we see that the preterm birth rate has actually slightly decreased and low birth rate has slightly decreased. Um, and the next slide will give some reasons of why we think that this is. And then, um, however, we can see that there's a large disparity between Caucasian women and African American women. So probably the, some of the drop could be a, a combination of factors. One is the rise in the use of progesterone uh, for pre preventing preterm labor, as well as March of Dimes campaign uh, of really, along with um, A1s go the full 40, so really trying to decrease people inducing individuals prior to being full term. When we, they do re, 
uh, released March of Dimes, a report card, and overall the United States got a C, and some states obviously, um, actually we won't go into which states, but got um, Fs and Ds. So I think we all know the definition of infant mortality, but um, so what are some of the indicators? And Dr. Hamami talked a lot about that yesterday. Some of the social determinants, gender discrimination, exposure to crime and violence, access to resources, income and level of daily stress. So in this slide, I show national, state, and then the city of Detroit. On um, the left-hand side, you can see for all races, the infant mortality rate for the United States was approximately 6.1 per 1,000. So uh, for African Americans, we can see that it is 11.42. In the state of uh, Michigan, still between all and African American, it was about doubled. And in the city of um, Detroit as well, um, so 2,300 Detroit babies died before their first birthday, and uh, the last stats that we had in one year, 743. We actually, I, uh, um, prior to my current position as a professor, I was the director of maternal child for Detroit Wayne County Health Authority, and um, we actually also looked at, um, by geocode, where are the infant deaths uh, occurring? And then we tried to target some of our initiatives uh, within those areas. So we can see that as Dr. Hamami talked about yesterday, place really does matter um, in regards to infant death. In regard to maternal mortality, thank the Lord it's not counted in 1,000s, it's counted in 100,000s, but uh, we know that the United States state spends um, the most of any nation per capita on uh, hospitalizations for childbirth and pregnancy, and yet we really see some of our startling um, statistics here. So we've seen that the uh, maternal mortality rate has doubled in the last 25 years mostly, um, um, and we're the highest among, amongst any developed nation. Here we can see uh, for an African-American woman, the rate is 3.2 times higher than if you're a Caucasian woman. And in Detroit, the rate is actually higher than if you live in um, Libya, Uruguay, or Vietnam. So we're definitely surrounded by some of the best medical schools. We've got University of Michigan, we've got um, Wayne State, We've got uh, uh, Michigan State, so we've got good minds there. We have world-class facilities. We have the Detroit Medical Center. We have Henry Ford Health System, Beaumont, University of Michigan Health System, and yet we see these outcomes. Uh, so some of the, uh, what, what I'd like to just review for you is some of our Detroit landscape so that it can put it in some context of why some of this might be happening. So when we look at population, the blue is Detroit, the red um, is Michigan, and the green is the United States. So we can see that predominantly uh, um, we have uh, a lot more African American um, population. When we look at marital status of males, I'm just going to focus mostly on males never married and females uh, never married. So we have a higher population than when you look at the green, the national rate of individuals that are unmarried or in stable, really, situations. When we look at the median outcome, uh, uh, income, we can see the difference between Detroit, Michigan, and the United States. Uh, for a program that I was uh, um, the director of, which is the Nurse Family Partnership, the majority of our clients actually made less than $6,000 in a year. So uh, the range was three to $6,000 income per year. So we can see that it was uh, an indigent population. So we look at education between Detroit, Michigan, the United States. Uh, we again see that many more in Detroit have not completed high school and that uh, few less have completed an advanced degree. 
Oh, where is the pointer? Thanks. So how do I? Oh, okay. This one, thank you, okay. So crime rate, we can see um, Detroit again in the blue, and then just to acclimatize you, 100% is just put it at the national rate for murder, rape, robbery, assault, burglary, larceny. So we can see again, uh, as compared to the national rate in Detroit, uh, individuals are confronted with a lot more crime. Number of uh, vehicles, uh, public transportation is uh, definitely unreliable and it is the home of the, uh, uh, the invention of the car, the auto industry. So there is a lot of uh, um, push to actually own your own car, but we can see how many individuals that we have far less people that actually have uh, access to a vehicle and yet we don't have a good public transportation system as well. So getting to your prenatal care can be of great difficulty. So as compared to the national average, which is about 7% of individuals who have no car, we have close to 20%. So the life course approach, which is also known as a life course perspective or life course theory, uh, theory, really kind of looks at analyzing people's lives from structural, social, and cultural contexts. And we know that chronic and toxic stress has obviously um, large impacts physiologically in our body. It's widely known that um, Stress has significant negative birth outcomes, premature birth, low birth weight, infant more increased infant mortality, um, and then down the line, further uh, childhood uh, and early childhood development. So we can see if you have all of this chronic and toxic stress as well as generation after generation. I enjoyed the clip that uh, was shown yesterday from Unnatural Causes, which actually looked at once individuals have had chronic and toxic stress like this for generation after generation, that it's not just going to change just because that young woman um, became a lawyer or moved to a nicer area, that there can be larger, longer impacts. And the other clip that they showed showing that it only really took one generation um, to have impacts. So those, those are important issues for us to know. And that we know that there's long-term effects of this toxic stress. Um, and really that from the time of getting pregnant, what are those impacts on, on an individual? So prenatal and early life stress has the broadest impact since all aspects of the brain are undergoing rapid development. So prolonged activation of the stress response. Um, we know that exposure to toxic stress early in the development when the brain's most vulnerable can lead to long-term uh, imprint, that much of the cognitive and emotional preparation for a successful life is determined uh, during early stages of development. During this time, the nervous system's growing, structure of the brain's being constructed, and that prolonged activation of the stress response in the absence of protective buffering causes long-term changes in the brain's structure. So what we've focused on on some of the programs that I'm going to talk about is this what are some of these protective buffering uh, that we can help to build some resilience into individuals. So sources of toxic stress we've talked a lot about when I uh, showed you between issues that can um, our population in Detroit especially deals with. Uh, and then um, interpersonal and community violence is one aspect and obviously our socioeconomic status and long-term racism. So uh, what do we need to assure the following? So basic medical care, so hopefully the Affordable Care, care Act will obviously help with many of our uninsured, but just because someone gets insurance doesn't mean that they are literate in their, their health care needs as well as how to navigate a system. 
um, early and intensive support for vulnerable families by skilled home visitors. And um, there is a program um, called Nurse Family Partnership, which is a national program. Do you have that program in Chicago? Okay, uh, Nurse Family Partnership is a program that all obstetricians, uh, um, all healthcare practitioners can refer their clients to. It's actually a free program. Um, individuals need to be their first pregnancy, and part of the reason it's their first pregnancy is that they feel that uh, people are the most open to change because they are kind of mystified by all of what is occurring to them and that they're open to change. And as well as they've done some randomized clinical trials and they felt that that is where they saw the largest change in individuals during that time frame. Um, it's an intensive program, so it's for women who want to try and change the trajectory of their lives. Nurses go into the home and spend an hour to an hour and a half with people, and I'm going to go over the domains of what they discuss with them. Um, there's six domains that we're working on, and there's we're really looking at using motivational interviewing and help people with behavior change and uh, what do, would they like to change in their lives. So we go in every week for the first month that they're in their program, every two weeks till they give birth, every week again from birth till six weeks postpartum, then every two weeks till their baby is 21 months, and then every month until their baby is two years old. So we're really, really building a long-term um, relationship with someone and then communicating with their practitioners. So it's a supportive practice to individuals. Uh, so really what are we trying to work on when we're looking at that program, but also any program that, that we're going to be initiating, which is really how do we foster resilience? So we know that there's individual characteristics, family characteristics, community supports, and then in environmental factors that can really help to look at how can we build in some of the buffering. So we know that from individual characteristics, if we have healthy attachment to caring adults, effective parenting, helping individuals um, with problem solving skills and how do you break a problem down and look at it? How do you figure out what your options are? What are the pros and the cons? Those are skills that individuals can learn. Um, perceived efficacy, motivation, um, looking at friends and um, partners and how you can potentially move away from destructive relationships and engage. So sometimes when we have clients who might be in a domestic violence situation, um, really building up other, in order to leave that relationship, maybe they first have to get in a safe environment if they can, but if they're unwilling to leave that situation, maybe they need to finish high school so that they can get a job. Maybe they need to start building other relationships in order to move away from that uh, or other substance abuse issues, helping individuals with how do I navigate making that behavior change. Um, and then looking at family characteristics, we help to look help individuals look at their situation and navigate. Uh, Dr. Hamami talked a lot about safe neighborhoods, support systems, prevention programs, and um, so resilience, understanding the mechanisms and processes that create. Create resilience individuals and communities is the key to developing preventative and restorative interventions. Resilience is enhanced by personal characteristics that can be strengthened or damaged by experiences, and it's developed through successful negotiation of these stressful situations. So we can't necessarily change all of the things that are coming at someone, but we can help individuals with how they interpret that stress and build some resilience to that. So as I said, nurse family partnership, we take care of um, first time moms. They have to come into the program no later than the end of their 28th week. So as long as they're 28 and six sevenths, they can still come in the program. Part of that reason is you're trying to impact change and decrease preterm labor. So you need to get them into the program earlier. 
So it is an evidence-based, theory-driven uh, program. Uh, it's built on three theories, ecology theory, self-efficacy, and attachment uh, theory. And it's an intensive nurse home visitation program, and it really focuses on intervention. Um, the nurses, all of the nurses go through an orientation and then everyone goes to Denver, Colorado for training in motivational interviewing and behavior change modeling. And then um, within the group as well, we do weekly case conferences, team meetings, and one-to-one -one self reflective practice for an hour each week. Um, Five client-centered principles, which is really some of the thought process of uh, even when we're interviewing people as to um, who would be a good nurse family partnership nurse is the belief that an individual is the expert of their own life and that we have to work with individuals, that we have to find out what is their heart's desire of changing? So you can talk to someone all you want. You need to stop smoking or you need to leave this relationship. But if that is not a goal of theirs, it's just talking <laughs> to someone. So you have to find out and engage with someone as to what is their goals and that we're a strength-based and solution-based program and that we believe that only a small change is necessary. So if someone can make a little change, then a little, a little, a little, next thing you know, they'll get some momentum and um, be able to hopefully move mountains down the down the future. We have visit to visit guidelines that we adapt and then we individualize the program based on clients' needs. So the six domains that we work, uh, this is myself and um, my team, um, our personal health, environmental health, life course, um, maternal role, friends and family, health and human services. Uh, we also launched a nurse midwifery program um, while I was there. So as I said, we mapped out based on geocode where the worst infant and um, some of the worst neighborhoods were, and then we strategically placed nurse midwives in those communities and then had nurse home visitation um, coming into the home as well. So the nurses were at the health centers in those neighborhoods, and then the nurses went into the client's home. If it was an unsafe situation, um, then they would meet them in a more public area, uh, so maybe at a library or someplace that we would consider a safe zone. So why do what do midwives do differently, and why did we choose um, midwifery care to go into these neighborhoods, which is really uh, addressing, because in Detroit, when you see we have some of the best medical systems, but always approaching something from a medical model rather than sometimes we have a, a kind of a different paradigm from the nurse midwifery. So really the support of physiologic birth. We know that the induction of labor rate, at least in this country, is double what the World Health Organization actually recommends. We're over 20%, and we know that we have a cascade of events that it can occur with cesarean section with that. So what is normal physiologic birth? It's the uh, allowing spontaneous onset and progression of labor, really looking at the biological and psychological conditions that promote an effective labor. Um, vaginal birth, uh, and then skin-to-skin -skin contact and early initiation of um, breastfeeding. Um, we launched and uh, we or hosted, not launched, we hosted a the world premiere of a documentary called Microbirth. Has anyone here seen that film? It's a really interesting film. It uh, came out of England. And part of the reason that we wanted to host that film, so we invited politicians, hospital administrators, physicians, researchers, educators, and um, from nursing, social work, a wide array of practitioners. Um, and we, Dr. Hamami, who is our medical director for Wayne County, was the moderator for the event, and we flew in some of the researchers that were in the film. Uh, so we had a um, meet and greet. We had some of our 
pregnant mums and we had belly casted them. Um, so you actually make like a cast of their pregnant abdomen. We had them talk to artists about their hopes and their dreams. And then we visually interpreted that onto the belly casts. So we had the belly cast there. We had our mothers there. They actually um, had the opportunity to like walk the red carpet. And we had um, Aveda came and did their hair and their makeup. So to try and make them feel um, really excited about being in the program. And uh, so the documentary really deals with what are the long-term impacts when we don't enter birth spontaneously? How does that alter things? Definitely induction of labors are very needed when there's a medical reason. But when we don't allow someone to spontaneously go into labor, and then the cascade of things that can occur, if someone doesn't travel through the birth canal, and that's the first time that they're gonna be mounting an immunological response, skin-to-skin um, -skin contact, not going over into the corner, being wiped down, um, spending half an hour with the nurse in the corner and bonding with that nurse, but right to mum's chest uh, um, and initiation of breastfeeding, that when um, the film actually documented and talked a lot about the mounting research, about how that actually impacts the microbiome, and then long-term population health changes that can occur, that we're seeing an increase in um, GI issues from celiac disease to diabetes to certain types of cancers. So, uh, and then the panel discussion was really just trying to get researchers, clinicians beginning to talk. So then after that is when we were launching our midwifery service. So it was a way to bring some attention to some of the issues and attention for the clients as well to start thinking, ah, there's a scientific reason that I might also should be breastfeeding. So some of the, the thought process of why we did that. So what are some of the disruptions of normal um, physiologic birth? And we brought that up, these up a lot during the panel discussion. So induction or augmentation of labor, um, unsupportive environments, uh, in the birthing environment, time constraints uh, and staffing, nutritional deficient, um, deprivation, um, and the list is here. And then ending, obviously, if operative births, if they are not indicated, sometimes they obviously they're life saving uh, when they're needed. So what are practices that support normal physiologic birth and some of those um, have been well documented, which is access to midwifery care, really time shared, making decisions, and um, really informing individuals, um, decreasing in inductions unless there's a medical reason, and um, thinking of other reasons rather than augmentation all the time. So I, one thing that we often hear talk about is uh, people will often talk about moving the board clearing a board off rather than thinking of that individual woman and the impact of, of decisions, even something that might seem innocent as to augmentation just to speed up a labor, but um, the ramifications of that. Encouragement of food and drink during labor, um, freedom of movement, getting up on the birth balls, using the showers, using the tubs, intermittent um, monitoring for low-risk healthy women. Um, Providers that know how to help individuals with non-pharmacologic uh, ways of coping with discomfort um, and really thinking about cultural needs. So there uh, have been um, randomized clinical trials, which obviously have shown comparing apples to apples and uh, of care and are in support of midwifery care. Uh, one other thing that I'll just kind of end on that we've been really trying to talk about um, with our clients and is part of an initiative of um, in Detroit, the mayor rolled out a program called Make Your Date and the prenatal care is called Expect With Me and the midwives are actually giving that, that care um, and that is a group model of care with all of the clients. It's, so we're using a centering model of prenatal care. And then within that program, we are really doing a lot of mindfulness training. Um, so um, 
has everyone heard of mindfulness and mindfulness-based stress reduction? So um, just so you know, what is mindfulness? It's really focusing, focusing one's attention in a non-judgmental or accepting way, um, really observing your physical, your emotional, and your thought process. So, uh, um, and what are some of, some of the qualities of mindfulness that we're trying to work on when we're doing mindfulness training? Non-judging, being present, um, having patience, using having a beginner's mind at things. So uh, we've had one of our case studies was when a nurse uh, said that while she was there visiting, um, the, the, the mom was very upset and just grabbed the baby's arm and threw the baby on the couch while she was sitting there. So that's what she did when there was someone there. Um, so we know that there, I would assume, be instances of that when people aren't there. So really helping that woman stop for a second and think, what is going on? And when she talked to her a lot, it was, she was, she was angry uh, with the baby because it was crying, and she said that this baby is trying to control me and get it to come over here and talk to, you know, pick it up, and that that's controlling. And then as she talked to her more and more, it really was her thoughts of she was in a situation, a domestic violence situation, and that her anger just had thoughts. They were not appropriate to the baby. So stopping and thinking. So some of it is just, let's be in the moment of what's occurring with this situation and not um, something else that's going on. So some of the qualities of helping someone, um, letting go, acceptance, non-striving. So um, here are some um, books that we've been encouraging our clients to read, Mindful Birthing, Mindful uh, uh, Motherhood. We often use apps on our phone as well, and I'll show you an app. Uh, and some of the reason that we use an app uh, rather than always doing it is for them to see, I can do this again and again, even if it's for one minute or three minutes without you. So rather than thinking that they need us in order to practice mindfulness. And um, then we also talk a little bit about other mindfulness, um, nursing, mindfulness, walking, so in incorporating uh, other things. So this is one of the apps that we use, stop, breathe, think. And they are very easy apps. They can actually, you can even set them to like Bing and just uh, three times a day. And just even sometimes you can, it just might have you just take a deep breath for three deep breaths and then move on. So uh, what we really need, I think, in some ways is a paradigm shift is essential. So um, we really need to look at not only what we are doing, but the base of the problem. So if we continue just to fix, if we're leave, leave and we're just fixing all the leaves, we're not dealing with the root cause issues. So I think that for us to really look at, number one, the social determinants, uh, what are upstream ways of fixing things, and then uh, having a true belief that people can be resilient, and, and but setting up programs that you can use to help build um, strengths and help to bridge gaps. So that is it. Uh.